Hey guys, welcome back. We are continuing with this side note right here. Now this is an interesting one. This is Romans chapter 9, if you're not familiar with the passage. Uh, Paul has just spent a lot of time going over uh, the Jews and their place in the gospel and, and all the things that God did to use the Jews leading up to this point. We then get into this discussion right here, kind of on the tail end of, uh, again, he's, he's talking about the Gentiles being grafted in and some of the Jews uh, are not of the promise because they never they never repented they never trusted Christ uh, they d turned their back on God repeatedly and, and so he's drawing attention to the fact that there are those who are Gentiles who are grafted in and those who are Jewish who never were in or aren't in anymore and and this whole idea is God can do whatever he wants he can pull whoever he wants in he can kick whoever he wants out and again it does seem to be based on their obedience and their trust to trust in God. Uh, but, but, but look here, because what he does in this case is he then starts talking about God's sovereignty and God's power to do whatever he wills. Now, again, our working definition of sovereignty is the freedom of God to do whatever he wants, as long as it's within his character. Okay. And that, that character is, is both, uh, a revealed thing. It is his character traits. It's what he promised he will and won't do. So there's a lot to that character, uh, but we talked about the idea that God will never create a contradiction. He'll never create something that is uh, against him, so he'll never lie, things like that. But look at this, because this text then starts digging into the utter control God has uh, over all these situations. Uh, look at verse 10. It says this, and not only this, and, and again, he's, he's digging into the, the promise of the seed and all of that. Verse 10, it says, not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even our father Isaac, for the children not being born, neither having done anything good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand. So, so God preordained, he elected this, and in order that the election would work, he then decided to make some declarations. So God, before this situation, said, this is going to be what's going to happen. And then he starts working in creation to make sure that thing he declared will happen. So he says, according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. So uh, it's not dependent on anything that Jacob or Esau or any of these guys decide. Uh, I mean, obviously Isaac conceived them, but that's about the extent of, of man's involvement here. But look what, what it is. God is choosing to, to select a group of people, and he's choosing to select specific members of that group. And look what happens in verse 12. It says, And he said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. And so Paul states his point. He quotes a verse to back up his point. And then he starts playing these mental games to help us understand. And he says this. He says, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness in God? Is it unrighteous of God to do this? Obviously not. Simply put. That, that's what Paul's trying to make the case here. He's saying there's no unrighteousness in God in choosing this person over this person. And he did. He just, he looked and he said, Jacob, here you go. I, I chose you, Esau. I chose not to, you, I, I didn't choose you. But actively there is a, a choice there. And look at verse 15. He quote, Paul quotes another verse. He said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will mercy who I will mercy. I will compassion who I will compassion. Okay, so so you see it again. He's saying, I will do what I want to do. I will make choices. I am free to do that, and you are not free to question. Verse 16, so then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but it is of God that showeth mercy. Now, this is going to tie directly into Ecclesiastes, because he's going to talk about the race is not always to the swift, and the, the battle is not always to the strong. You know, but but he uses the shorthand for God, which is time and chance. Time and chance happeneth to them all. And it's this idea of God working behind the scenes. That's exactly what Paul's saying here. God is going to do what God's going to do. Now you get into verse 17. And, and this is the case where as you get into the idea of God's sovereignty. Let me move that over to the side. As you get into the idea of God's sovereignty, you, you get into this, this interesting discussion. What God can do, and you see this throughout the Bible, is God can build a hedge of protection around someone. You see this in Job, for instance, where God puts a hedge and protects what Job has. And people think that Job serves God only because he's got that hedge. And so God said, fine, I'll remove the hedge and we'll let these bad things happen. And 
I'll show you that it's not just because of the hedge that he serves me. And so what happens is, is God will do that. There are other times where it talks about God turning them over to their vile affections. And so it's this idea that even around sometimes the wicked, God will protect them, keep them from doing things. He'll prevent their uh, ability to do certain things. And there are times where God will just simply say, nope, I'm going to spiral you out and let you go do whatever you want to do. So, so keep that in mind, because now what you've got in Pharaoh is God has this, this, this border that he's put up to say Pharaoh can't go too far. And, and again, if you, if you doubt that God does this, think about um, uh, some of the, the kings in, in Genesis, for instance. And uh, so what you've got is you've got uh, this one king who takes Abram's wife, and what does he do? He takes her as his own. She's part of his harem. He's about to do haremly stuff. And God literally prevents him from doing it and says, if you touch her, you're a dead man. And he's like, I, I, didn't, I didn't know. I didn't mean to. And God's like, exactly. And that's why I withheld you from sinning because I knew, I, I knew you were innocent. I, I knew you didn't mean to do it. And so there are times where God will prevent us from sin. Again, his own option, his own choice. And he, in that case, prevented this guy from sinning to prevent a judgment being poured out on him. Now look what he does in Pharaoh. What he does in Pharaoh is he actually hardens Pharaoh's heart. Now what this means with hardening Pharaoh's heart is it was a, a religious significance to them. What they would do is when they would die, they would be uh, brought, you know, the underworld and you've got the, the various gods of the Egyptian pantheon. And there was a belief that, that you would present yourself before the gods and you would have to read out of this book. And, and obviously when you read out of this book, there was no way you could actually honestly say you never did any of these sins. All right. They, they, various contaminating activities. And, and the idea was if you read out of this book, your heart would grow guilty with, with the, the weight of your sin, and they would have a scale with your heart on one side, a feather on the other, and if your heart grew heavier than the feather, then you were guilty, and then you were, you were punished. So what they would do is when they were embalming you, they would stick a scarab on your heart, and what the idea was is that would absorb the guilt and conviction of what you were saying, and that was called hardening the heart. And, and all it means, if you don't understand any of that, that illustration, hardening the heart simply means you are able to lie, you are able to do whatever you need to do and not feel bad about it because you've got that scarab that's absorbing the guilt. And so in this case, when it talks about Pharaoh hardening his heart or God hardening Pharaoh's heart, basically what it is, is it's God giving Pharaoh the courage to stand up against him. And in some cases, it's Pharaoh determining not to give in either. So if you want to imagine Pharaoh as the hero of his story, and all of these conflicts, all of this difficulty arises, and Pharaoh, like a good hero of his story, is standing up saying, I'm not giving in. And, and, and in, in some sense, it's like this noble, like, you are just giving it the stiff upper lip. But, but really, he's resisting and fighting against God. And God says, yeah, I don't play that way. And so what, what God does is God makes a man Pharaoh, puts him in a position of authority. It's a type A personality, arrogant, proud, brash. And God basically says, I put you with that personality right there so that when I come along and when I come a call in, you're going to have the strength to resist me. And, and, and if you ever waver in your strength to resist me, I'm going to harden your heart so that you don't waver and that you keep resisting me because I want to show my strength and I am going to absolutely beat you down and I'm going to destroy all your gods with you. And so that's what he's doing. God is choosing to put Pharaoh, this arrogant, brash guy who thinks he's a god, God puts him in this position and then says, I'm going to strengthen you to resist what I have to say so I can do something. Now, we shouldn't have any pity on Pharaoh. Pharaoh was acting on the impulses of his own heart. Pharaoh was acting according to his own desires. Pharaoh had made years and years and years of decisions to do this sinful activity. And by the time God comes on the scene, Pharaoh goes, I don't know who this God is. I really don't care. I'm God here. And so that's 
again, I don't see why we should have any pity, but, but Paul even understands that there is this natural gut reaction of like, how could God put you in that position and how could God do this and this and this and then still punish you for it? It's God's choice. It's, it's God who does this. God can put you in a position so he can smack you down later. I, I think of the, the city of Sodom where God gave them plenty of warning and they chose not to repent. And so God says, fine, I put up with you long enough. Now I'm going to wipe you out. Or, or you even think the people in the land when Israel came out of Egypt and they come into the land and God says, no, the iniquity is not yet full. It's not quite at the level I need to punish. And, and God could have destroyed them, step one. I mean, he did that with Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira, they sinned one time and God said, done. But there's other people who sin and sin and sin and sin and sin and sin. And, and that's what Ecclesiastes is getting at, where there's things where we look at it and go, where is the justice? And it's because it's waiting, it's, it's, it's slumbering. And so God can choose to say, I'm going to pour out my judgment on sin right now and I'm going to choose to be patient. It's his choice. It's his option. So we need to remember that when we are dealing with Pharaoh's story here. But again, look at verse 19. It says, uh, uh, again, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and whom he will he hardens. So he gives you the strength to resist him. Verse 19, who uh, thou will say then unto me, why dost he yet thou find fault for who hath resisted his will? And Paul's just asking this question. He's like, uh, okay, if God declares everything, who, who can say anything? Okay, but here's the simple truth. We have nothing to say to God. We have nothing to say back to God. We have no answer because, again, in his wisdom and in his long suffering, he chose to put up with us for as long as he chose to put up with us. So if he chooses, if he, if he chooses to put up with this guy for ages and then punish for his glory, that's his choice. If he chooses to say, nope, I'm not putting up with this at all, and he crushes right away, that's his choice. But we need to remember there is judgment waiting for all of us. And if God chooses to have mercy, if he chooses to put a hedge of protection, if he chooses to withhold us from sinning, that's his grace. And if he chooses to say, you know what? I'm not going to get in the way of you sinning. That's his sovereignty. That is his choice. He has that ability. There's, there's no conflict here. But look what he says. And in fact, Paul uses this same idea. He says, man, who are you to reply against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why have you made me this way? Has not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another vessel unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and make his power known, endured with much long suffering, like he did with Pharaoh, like he did with many men in the Bible, where he did not punish them right away. He let them continue in their sin. He chose to make his power known. He endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. We're all vessels of wrath, okay? Until we repent, until we choose to accept Christ, we are vessels of wrath fitted for destruction. We need to understand that all of us are in that fallen state and unless God chooses to have mercy, we are all in that fallen state. But look what he says. Verse 23, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he has before prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called, not the Jews only, but also the Gentiles. And then he goes, and he, he, he again, he goes back to the main point he's trying to make. But this is showing God's sovereignty in that he can choose to punish when he wants to. But we have to understand we're all waiting for punishment. But sometimes it lingers because he has a bigger thing waiting in the wings or he's choosing to have mercy. And so it's all that idea of God's mercy is, is long-suffering, it's waiting. But again, there might be a time where he says, you've passed this line, now you get punished. So just keep that in mind. As we walk through the remainder of these sovereignty texts, I think this is a very powerful passage to see how God works.